Discover over 100 episodes of Bartholomew Town on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. And I said, well, don't feel bad. Most white people never think about it that way. They don't have to think about it at all because, you know, being born in America, you're just presumed to be uh, innocent, good, you know, uh, uh, just uh, acceptable. And in America, no matter how much we may not like it, uh, people of color are always under suspicion. Welcome in to another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bartholomew, on today's episode my conversation with the president of the Providence chapter of the NAACP, Jim Vinson. Great to sit down with Jim Vinson. Lots to unpack in Rhode Island and beyond, of course. And we covered a lot of ground, though, in the conversation you'll hear in just a matter of moments. Remember, I love hearing from you. My email address is bill at ripodcast.com. And you can follow the pod on Instagram at Bartholomew Town Podcast. Support for Bartholomew Town comes from PDQ Graphics of Newport, a full service commercial printing company and graphic design studio serving Aquidneck Island and the surrounding area for over 40 years, specializing in creative graphic design, offset, and digital printing, as well as large format signage. Discover more at pdqri.com or give them a call at 401 849 3820. You can support the Bartholomew Town Podcast by subscribing, rating, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now. Okay, let's get to it. My conversation with the president of the NAACP's Providence chapter, Jim Vinson. I'm a Boston native. Yep. I'm a Cranston resident. Yep. Uh, Boston being a city of champions, but I know most Rhode Islanders, they share in that, so I think I can say that safely. Right. A few Yankees, <laughs> oh. appear, you know, people from the uh, the Italian domination days, right? Well, there's a, there's a reason for that. <laughs> yep. The Red Sox uh, saw fit to not have Italian ball players, so yep. I don't I don't blame uh, Italian uh, people and families uh, for, for rooting for our team that uh, embraced uh, their heritage, which Absolutely. was the Yankees. And it's fascinating. Uh, there's, of course, a checkered history with the Red Sox, but, of course, ownership has changed. Not Very quite checkered. so. <laughs> but if you're, if you're being honest about it, sometimes it's you go, whoa, wait a second. It's been tough, but uh, yep. I've been a fan uh, since uh, Carl Yastrzemski was in his third year. Yeah. So I've been a fan for a while. Well, then you're in. You're embedded then. <laughs> embedded. Is, is, that's one way to say it. Yeah. We were kind of talking about, uh, as we were walking in, how – Rhode Island is – there's a Rhode Island brand of person. Let's be honest about it, right? I mean, that there's there are huge differences in from town to town. There's huge differences from school to school, any kind of institution to institution and person to person. But at the same time, Rhode Island is somewhat closed when it comes to, I guess, just plainly interacting with people that don't look and act like you, <laughs> if yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, it's not that much different than even uh, – a place like Boston, for example, yeah. where I'm from, because you have people that are from certain neighborhoods in Boston that don't interact with other people. And so I wouldn't say it's uniquely Rhode Island, but mm-hmm. there are a lot of people that have not uh, encountered people that are different than them. And it gives them a certain perspective that is 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 is, is perhaps uh, limited. I hate to say limited, but I think it's limited because, you know, the more people you know that are different than you, the the more you're going to think about, you know, what positions and what beliefs you have, and, and you get challenged. And not to say you're going to change any of it, but at least you, you, you pause and you have thought about what you may or may not believe, and I think that's healthy. It's about assessing your own standing in the world on a day-to-day basis, I suppose, and how, how big you are and also how small you are. A lot of times we hear, oh, I'm just a speck in the universe, but at the same time, each person's powerful. They can make their own decisions. They don't have to fall for the group thing. That's right. Each person can make uh, make a difference. Uh, everybody actually does make a difference, some larger than others. But I think that you know everybody has the potential to really be a, a change maker. Your Cape Verdean heritage is that that must play into Rhode Island here. That's such as the Fox Point. That here. that was one reason why I came. Uh, I was in Boston. I was looking to uh, to leave Boston. I was kind of frustrated because of the politics of Boston and uh, the racism in Boston. I was born and raised there. Went through the public school system. Went away to college in New Hampshire, grad school in Philadelphia, and then came back after six years. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of frustrated in that. I was struggling uh, to make a mark for myself, and I thought I worked hard, played by the rules, and I should have not have had the kind of struggles that I had. But Boston was Boston in the 70s and things uh, continued in the 80s so I said well I don't want to be bitter so let me just leave Mm -hmm. and uh, I was looking to move to Charlotte or Atlanta or maybe even back to Philadelphia but I saw an ad in the paper surprisingly 
for a housing coordinator for the city of East Providence, Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. And for me, uh, East Providence resonated because uh, within the Cape Verdean diaspora in America, East Providence has been always an enclave of Cape Verdean. So even yeah. though a lot of people in Boston might not have heard of any Rhode Island towns in particular, I knew that there were Cape Verdeans in East Providence. So I said, you know what? This could be interesting. You know, uh, I'll stay in my housing field. I'll be only one hour from home, and I'll be in a new state, and I'll uh, get to know Cape Verdeans a lot better than I than I, than I knew because I really did, never lived in a Cape Verdean community in Boston. <laughs> and I think it could be interesting. And so I said, let me just take the leap. Didn't know anybody. Didn't know anything about Rhode Island. But I said, you know what? I feel that this is something that is meant to be. Sure enough, here we are decades later. <laughs> 29 years later, I'm still here. Cape Verdean Independence Day also in uh, in is held in July 5th. It, that's, and that's, of course, that's in India Point Park. So India it's Point not, Park right is uh, probably the largest Cape Verdean Independence Festival in the country. I mean, yeah. uh, I've been to the New Bedford festivals. I, I go to the festival in Onset. And I know there's smaller festivals in Atlanta and in California. But I think in terms of festivals, the India Point Park Festival, which is our Rhode Island festival, probably is the largest. Uh, we've been independent since 1975, so it's only been 43 years, which is not... Uh, a short period of time, but it's, it is when you look at other other countries and how long they've been independent. Right. So there's there's probably more Cape Verdeans per capita in Rhode Island than any other state. The only states to come close is Massachusetts and and, and maybe Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut uh, used to have a lot of Cape Verdeans, but but now it's just Rhode Island and Massachusetts in terms of those numbers. So I feel at home here. Cape Verde is uh, off the west coast of Africa. People have been coming to this country for about 200 years. However, there was a break in immigration. Uh, There was an immigration uh, policy in America in 1924 that kind of shut down immigration from Cape Verde, Mm. and it didn't pick up again until independence in 1975. So those 50 years has created really two different communities. You have communities that have been here for 100, 150 years, and that that would be my family on both sides. And then there's communities that have been here like 40 years and less. And those are the communities that you see in Pawtucket, Brockton, and we call them newer communities. And we struggle to kind of remain unified because we have that difference in language. Portuguese is fascinating. My wife's Brazilian, and yeah. the dialect, just her dialect versus well, an Azorian person, yeah, it's and, a little and, bit and different. And with Cape Verde, it'd be a Portuguese dialect as well, but there's yeah. also a different language. Creole, involved, right? Creole, which yep. is a separate language. So Cape Verdeans are bilingual, and what happens is that if you're from Cape Verde, then you're bilingual, you speak Portuguese, you speak Creole. But if you're born in this country like I was, uh, we, we tend to only know Creole because mm. our families, once they're in America, they stop speaking Portuguese and they only speak Creole. Uh, and so you have people here that are first generation, second generation that speak Creole but no Portuguese. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about the NAACP action in Rhode Island. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm sure it's a day-to-day grind, you know, and that's a good way to put it. It is a day-to-day grind, and what people don't realize, and maybe I don't realize it as well, um, I get calls about uh, somebody uh, allegedly being discriminated against every day, at least one call, sometimes two calls, every single day. And the, my responsibility is to respond to those calls in one way or another, so I have to figure out how best to help this individual or groups of individuals. Sometimes it's referring them to the Human Rights Commission. Sometimes it's referring them to maybe some civil rights lawyers. Sometimes it's me meeting with the the director or the president of the company or agency to kind of reason with them if I think that they are guilty of this discrimination. Uh, Sometimes I use social media or media to get my point across, and sometimes that's the best way to go uh, because of the shaming of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but 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 a lot of the work is that work. Uh, and people wouldn't know about that because all this stuff is done confidentially because the individuals and families themselves, you know, they really don't want their case known. Right. Uh, in some cases they do, but in most cases they don't. So, so that's what I, a lot of what I do is about, trying to help people that have been discriminated against, primarily in employment, but sometimes in terms of the school system with their children or, or even in housing. Uh, now, the other side of the the, 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 the fence uh, in terms of what I do is uh, supporting issues and supporting uh, initiatives. Uh, the thing that the NAACP has been focused on over the last couple of years is the judiciary. You know, we woke up and found that out of 90 judges in Rhode Island, only two are of color. Yeah. And that's not, that's not acceptable. So we've been really focused in on trying to increase that number, working with the governor, working with the legislature, working with the judicial nominating panel. And we're happy that where it was two at the beginning of this year, now it's 
it's five. Yep. And there are two people, uh, one um, recommended to the governor for Superior Court, Maria Farrell Deaton, and there's another one I feel that's going to make it uh, as a magistrate and traffic tribunal, Alberto Cardona. I think he's pretty close. Uh, Is that which, Cranston? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's in Cranston. Yeah. Uh, he'll be a magistrate yep. uh, if he gets Senate confirmation. Then I'll bring it up to the grand total of seven if that happens out of 90. So our work is um, is daunting. Uh, however, going from two to perhaps seven within a year, uh, we feel that that's progress, uh, noticeable progress. And then, of course, there are other initiatives that are led by other legislators as well as uh, uh, groups uh, like uh, Direct Action for Rights and Equality or DARE. And, and I like to say, how dare they? <laughs> so there, there are issues that we've uh, uh, supported or signed up for, and they include um, early voting, yep. equal pay, a $15 minimum wage, the fair chance licensing uh, bill, uh, as well as the um, uh, source of income discrimination bill. Uh, also, we uh, support the, a bill banning the sentencing of juveniles to life without parole. Right. We feel that 15 years, uh, there should be a parole hearing and they should uh, make the case or, or, or not make the case, and, and then we'll see what happens. But, you know, there are those specific bills that we are uh, supporting this legislative session. On the housing side, income distri- or, or the, the way a person is able to pay their rent or whatever, that for lease, whatever it is that they're they're engaged in. I mean, that is so fundamental in terms of that needs to be changed. It's this counterintuitive. Year. You would think that a landlord would want a guaranteed check on the first of the month, right? And we're talking about Section Eight or uh, uh, SSI or or uh, some other form of uh, non-employment income. Uh, however, there's such a stigma in terms of people, at least in some landlords' minds, of those people that they would rather uh, forgo the guaranteed income to, to, to uh, rent to somebody that may or may not pay rent that month. So we feel that if you can afford the apartment, your source of income is immaterial. And 10 other states and 60 other cities and 30 other counties agree and all have laws prohibiting source of income discrimination, it would be. Sad. Um, yeah, cr- super outgoing Providence superintendent of schools, Christopher Maher, Maher said yesterday, Providence schools are fundamentally racist, and that is to blame for the 15% competency rate that we've seen for graduating students. Does that seem about right? Interesting that you say that. I didn't quite say that recently. I was on a television show re- recently that you're mm-hmm. familiar with, yep. and I said that until you have uh, p- teachers of color and staff and others in those schools, you're not going to see any fundamental change. Any other kind of reform is kind of tinkering around the edges, even though I, 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 should, I shouldn't say that. It's more than just tinkering. But the real change that has to happen in a, in a city like Providence where 92% of the children are of color, and even in the state, I don't think people realize that of all the state public school students, 45 to 50% are of color. I mean, we're almost at 50 percent statewide, all public schools, every community. And when you only have a fraction of those teachers being of color, there, there, there is a gap in terms of understanding, in terms of empathy, in terms of a lot of things. Study upon study, uh, when you look at students of color, have said that students of color, when they have a teacher of color, do demonstrably better under all kinds of different circumstances. And uh, so I'm a firm believer that, you know, teachers are good and they try, but if you don't understand your student, uh, we, we've seen people, you know, suspend students out of school for, for, for things that they would never suspend, maybe children that look like them. And what they don't understand is that it's not just that suspension, but that's the beginning of what we call the school-to-prison pipeline, which causes even more problems in our society. So we have to get it right at the front end. So we need to make sure these kids get educated. We need more teachers of color, and that's a responsibility on all of us, including the NAACP. Yeah, I've heard from kids who've gone to Times 2, one of the charter schools, that that changed, that element totally changed everything for them. Simply dealing on a daily basis with someone who looked like them, understood the nuances of yeah. the neighborhoods that they're coming from. I mean, it's so basic, but it's it's not happening. It's, it's really there, and I think, um, you know, I, 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 went, <laughs> I mean, he said it's a racist. I don't know if I'm going to uh, I actually say that. I don't know mm-hmm. if I have enough evidence to, to, for myself to say that because mm-hmm. I haven't paid a, as close attention to the schools as, of course, a superintendent. But I, but I do know that uh, a major problem, I mean, we're in a crisis. I mean, we're only 10% on a math level and on only 15% of Providence students are on reading level, uh, grade le- level. Uh, that's that. That's warehousing. That's uh, I don't know what you call that. That's certainly not a, a school system or an education system. So we are in a crisis, and people have not done anything other than tinker. 
you know, we need fundamental change. We need radical surgery. And uh, I'm glad that we have a new school uh, uh, superintendent at the Rhode Island Department of Education. Somebody has walked the walk of some of these kids that being an English language learner in, from New York, and as well as having a, an autistic son, uh, because we have a lot of disabled students that also are not being served well by the school system. So at least I think you have somebody that really understands uh, and, and is passionate enough that can make some, some fundamental change. Uh, it won't be uh, easy and it won't be overnight, but I think uh, you know, what she brings is an intangible that I think has been missing for a long, long time. What about the issue of, of the here in Providence and spilling into other communities as well. I mean, this applies in South Kingstown as well, but the relationship between police departments and different communities, do you feel like there's been improvement there, you know, but in terms of just mutual understanding? There, there's some improvement. It's getting better, not worse, I feel, uh, and a lot of that has to do with that. Uh, you've had some meaningful recruitment drives. Uh, most uh, uh, departments are from the state police down to municipal police, and even the sheriff's department and the corrections department, mm-hmm. they have reached out to me. I do have a television show on CW on Sunday mornings at yep. 9, 9 a.m. <laughs> Shameless plug. Uh, oh, no and, shame there. And, and, no, the no, <laughs> and, they, and, they, and, they, and they reach out to me. Matter of fact, the East Province Police Department is going to come on the show in a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. and I just had the Rhode Island sheriffs, uh, uh, they came on because they're doing recruitment. And, and the corrections was uh, a couple of months before that. Yep. So the, at least I see the people trying to uh, at least uh, uh, reach out to figure out, and they understand that you've got to have more people that look like the people to, to have better policing and better, uh, uh, you know, uh, guarding of, uh, like in the case of corrections. So, you know, that intangible is there. I mean, but also but you have to look at the system. I mean, we have over-policing in communities of color. That's why when the ACLU did a study for marijuana possession, they found that, Three times more blacks than whites were arrested for marijuana, despite the fact that the usage was either the same or whites used marijuana more. So that's that. There's no standing de- deviation. I took stat in college that explains that. Yeah. That is targeting. That is blatant targeting, over policing. Uh, you know, you go into certain neighborhoods and you, you come in looking for the marijuana possession where you have other communities that are like just out in the open and you don't do a thing. Yeah, kids driving around, kids and running smoking around, right. and, the, and, you know, down the road and, and it with, becomes with, a violation. With the top violation. down, blowing right. the smoke out and nobody says a word. Yep. Whereas uh, kids are walking down the street and not noticeably having anything and they're being stopped uh, uh, for whatever and uh, getting arrested for a marijuana possession. So it's, 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 it's targeting based on race, uh, and uh, that has to end. 100% agree there as well. Um, white privilege is something that comes up all the time in Rhode Island. I hear people complaining about the notion. They'll say, well, I'm a tolerant person, and we had the Reverend uh, Donnie Anderson on here, and, and uh, she did a spectacular job of articulating the GI Bill, the modern-day fundamental you know, just disproportionate amount that certain groups are getting screwed out of since World War II. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I mean, how do you advocate uh, f- for correcting a policy that's, you know, almost 100 years in the making that most people don't understand is even happening? Well, first of all, you got to c- make white people understand what the term white privilege mean. Uh, most white people that I talk to think white privilege means that they grew up in Barrington or East yeah, Greenwich exactly. and uh, yeah. they had a silver spoon in their mouth and they said, no, no, I'm working class and, and I'm not prejudiced. And, and I'm saying white privilege has nothing to do with that almost at all. Yeah. You know, white privilege is the fact that, you know, you're not going to be stopped in a store for just being in the store. When a cab comes up and uh, you put your hand out, they're going to pick you up uh, where they may not pick me up with a three-piece suit and a briefcase. Uh, you have the privilege of uh, always being assumed to be right and correct and good and with have the white hat. And in the lo- large part, people of color are always assumed to be bad and negative and whatever. You go for a job, the HR uh, director, he assumes that you're qualified unless proven otherwise through your interview. Where if I'm going for an interview as a black person, I'm assuming to be unqualified unless proven otherwise through my interview. So that's why privilege. You have something that I can never have, regardless of what my income may be. It's that presumption that you are right, you are correct, you are good. It's like trying to explain to fish what water is. It's just right there from birth. So you don't think of it because you don't have to think of it. But, you know, you, you, you can go from one side of town to the other, or you can do a lot of different things, and there's never any assumption that you're doing anything wrong simply because you're white. Uh, they look at your skin. They don't know you. Uh, you know, they have no reason to feel that you're, you're bad or whatever. Uh, you're assumed to be good. But if you're a person of color, 
not in everybody's mind, but in too many people's minds, you're assumed to be suspicious or uh, up to something. What are you doing here? And already you have that dynamic, and then tensions could rise if just certain things go out of whack in the conversation, and that's and that's what happens. So, so I've had programs about white privilege where we we, we try to talk about it so that people are not put off by the term because sometimes when you start talking about that, people shut down because they just say, here we go again. Yeah. And so you're not constructive. You're not going to go anywhere when people are not really wanting to listen to it or whatever. I remember the Speaker of the House, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, flubbed the, the term white privilege, but but unfortunately for him, it made the paper and it made the Gene Valacini's WPRO uh, news program. Yeah. And I, uh, when I, when asked by both, because they wanted to know my take on it, I said, I find it hard that the Speaker of the House, who I just worked with to pass racial profile legislation, wouldn't understand this. You know, I, 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 I find it hard that he didn't understand it. So um, I got a call from him later on that day, and he said, I want to meet with you. And I came in, and he said, I just want to thank you. You could have really uh, come down hard on me, but uh, you didn't. And I just want to explain to you what I think it is. And, and, and he basically thought it was about being a racist or being rich. Or, I said, it's t- not that at all. This is what it is. And after I explained it to him, then he understood. And he right. said, well, I never thought about it that way. And I said, well, don't feel bad. Most white people never think about it that way. They don't have to think about it at all. Because, you know, being born in America, you're just presumed to be uh, innocent, good, you know, uh, uh, just uh, acceptable. And in America, no matter how much we may not like it, uh, people of color are always under suspicion. Yeah, that's an interesting anecdote of the speaker as well, kind of reaching out behind the scenes there. He did know. do that, and I'm going to give him the credit for that because, uh, you know, he uh, knew that I could have, uh, you know, uh, said something very negative about him. Uh, but I said that, you know, is that going to get me where, where I need to be? I mean, we, we have to work together in the state to pass legislation. So even though uh, I wasn't happy with him not understanding it, I said, is he really any more different than any other white person out here in Rhode Island that I've met? Not really. I mean, he's basically of the same thinking of the vast majority. So he's not an outlier. Right. So I gave him a pass on that. Not that I can give people a pass, but oh, well, you uh, can I, actually. But I, but I but I had to because uh, with Gene Bellasini and also the Journal are calling, I, I, I have to say something. Yeah. So uh, so it worked out well because uh, it was a it was a teachable moment, and uh, we've maintained a friendship uh, up to this point. And uh, you know, I'll be asking him to support various pieces of legislation, some of, it, of which I've mentioned, mm-hmm. <laughs> and. And um, hopefully uh, he, he's, he'll be the fair kind of person that I think he, he is and, and support uh, stuff that really going to make a positive difference in Rhode Island, despite what he might be hearing from other people who oh, I don't think are really looking out for Rhode Island, but they're looking out more for themselves. Yeah. Well, that's a narrative that we have to constantly assess here. Absolutely. Do, yeah. do you feel comfortable with – I mean you seem to have a good working relationship with the governor, Gina Raimondo. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you feel the other state officers, I guess, really important would be the attorney general's office? Do you feel like you have a good relationship there? I, I feel I have an excellent relationship with the current attorney general. Yes. And I'm sorry to say I had absolutely no relationship with the previous attorney general. Oh, you mean Sarasota no. resident Peter Kilmartin? Uh, well, I don't know uh, what part of Florida <laughs> that he's allegedly living in. I don't want to go there. Right. But I had absolutely no relationship with him. And the fact that you have a Democratic attorney general that has no relationship with the NAACP, I mean, that, that that's that's shocking. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think any other attorney generals from other states that are Democrats would, uh, would believe that. But he had to work to get that title. Yeah, it's... It's a whole other thing. I mean, we yeah. see with the Google documents being yeah. released as yeah. well, Patricia Morgan suddenly becomes yeah. kind of a heroine of yeah. this, you oh. know, this idea that, yeah, there was a, a flaw at the AG's office over the last few years. I think so. that's how it started. I wanted to know where the Google money was going years yep. ago. And uh, I think uh, he was outraged, the fact that I would even ask, yeah. you know, who are you, you know, so to speak. Right. And uh, I, I just thought that that was just unbelievable because you're a public servant. You know, anybody should have the right to ask that question and to, be, to react so negatively to a group uh, like the NAACP. Right. Uh, yeah, that really just speaks volumes to right. me and a lot of other people when they heard that that was happening. Didn't, yeah. didn't help him at all with a lot of people. Absolutely. And uh, you got off to a real bad start when he started. And, um, you know, so th- with this present uh, attorney general, I have a great working relationship going back to when he was a U.S. attorney. Mm-hmm. Uh, we worked with uh, some cases uh, through his office as well as with the FBI, who he introduced me to. And I just thought he was very pro- pro- proactive and very, really uh, the kind of person that wanted to get uh, things done in a positive way. So uh, I, I'm, I'm on his diversity 
committee. Uh, I, I gladly uh, volunteered to be a part of that. He just put that together about two weeks ago. And I, you know, I just can't speak uh, highly enough of uh, our current Attorney General, Pina Rona, as well as the other officers. Uh, I have a great relationship with uh, Secretary of State Nellie Gobea, yep. great relationship with Treasurer Seth Magazina, great relationship with uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee. Uh, as, and as you stated, I do have a great relationship with the governor. So I feel blessed the fact that, you know, I can call on any one of them and they, uh, you know, will return my phone call. Uh, it's not like that in a lot of other places. Yeah, good humans. I think that's something I've discovered in – haven't spent time. I have not interviewed the governor, but I have been around her. And, and But the others I have interviewed multiple times and spent time with. And you're right. It's they're, – they're people that listen, you know, yeah. and that's the number one qu- quality that, that stands out. To well, me. I met the governor uh, before she became treasurer. You know, she mm. was running for treasurer, yeah. and uh, she actually came on my show a couple of times as she was running for treasurer. Yep. And then after she was elected treasurer in her first year, she was on my show as well to talk about what she wanted to do as treasurer. So I <laughs> I reminded her that I have not had her on my show since she's been governor, so yeah. it's been way too long. So uh, I, I look forward to having her uh, there. Last question, as economic development starts to um, refine itself, as, as the state starts to continue to attract mid-sized companies and, and downtown Providence continues to become hopefully a tech hub. Newport's becoming, they're trying to make that into a tech hub down there. That's not going to work out. I can call that now, but they're trying, uh, you know, and Newport, of course, one of the most segregated places I've ever lived. You know, there's literally fences around communities, but do you feel like there's, it, it, it's an inclusive enough process in terms of rebuilding the state, jobs, economic development, workforce development, or is that kind of going too narrow right now towards a certain type of person, to a certain type of, of, of uh, institution that would come to Rhode Island? Well, I, I, have, I have concerns on a lot of different levels. One, uh, I have a concern that you're not going to get these kind of businesses to come in because we don't have the trained, educated, motivated labor force. Yeah. We alluded to the school system earlier. Uh, companies don't have to come into – a place with a school system like that, and and Providence is is is, is probably a worse example in Rhode Island. But Rhode Island, if it was in Massachusetts and it was a city, it would be in the top the bottom 10% right. of Massachusetts in terms of scores. So Rhode Island has a problem. You know, you can go to Massachusetts, you can go to Connecticut. You don't have to come to Rhode Island uh, because uh, you can get that trained, educated, motivated labor force in, the, in two nearby states. So i got a problem with that. I always have a problem that I don't think there are enough people of color uh, in at the table in terms of making the decisions in terms of almost everything in this state. Uh, I don't think there's one agency or organization, uh, state, local, or quasi-public or nonprofit that has anywhere near enough uh, people of color at the decision-making table. Boards uh, of directors, boards all of directors, stuff, yeah. staff at the senior level. Everyone is is lacking. Is lacking. Uh, I mean, there might be one or two that may may uh, be able to uh, be an exception. So I don't want to broad brush it completely. I'll, okay, let me just say it this way: ninety nine percent, ninety nine percent. Let me just make uh, it be known that there might be one percent that's actually representative of uh, senior level staffing, policy making, policy makers, boards of directors, uh, all of which make decisions better because when you have a, di- a diversity of thought. People, decisions in any situation are better. You know, if you have played a stock market, you have large cap, mid cap, uh, small cap. In sports, you know, you have the point guard, you have the power forward. Have, so whenever you have diversity, you get a better result. Only when it comes to employment and economic development do we forget all that. Yep. And we, we, we forget the fact that we're leaving out a third of the state, which is uh, people of color. And we can't do that. We cannot make any decisions unless – I'm not saying uh, a third of the people – a third of the, any board or agency at the senior level has to be of color. I'm not a math major or a bean counter. Yeah. However, if you got 1 percent, 2 percent, you are definitely not making the best decisions at, when it comes to this state. I mean it's just uh, – it, by definition – uh, you're making poor decisions because you're not nearly inclusive enough, and not just in terms of people of color, but there's other people, other groups of people that need to be there too, uh, the disabled, and, 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 and there's even others uh, of different uh, persuasions that should be there because they make up the state too, the richness of the state. So people, you know, I guess it goes back to that privilege. They're so used to seeing all white, all male uh, people around the table. They don't even notice that there's no women or there's no people of color. When I mean, you point it out, oh, really? Oh, yeah, there isn't. Oh, I, I didn't even notice that. Oh, we got to do something about that. And so once it's pointed out to them, 
the obvious, we've got to point out the obvious to them, uh, then they might want to make some decisions in some cases. But uh, we, we have too many people that are walking around oblivious to what's going on in this state, and it's got to change. On that note, Jim Vincent, NAACP, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. I mean, this has been a delight, and, uh, you know, I would like to uh, make sure that I come on as a regular guest because I things change. That. I would absolutely love that. And, of course, you've got your television show on the CW. You're on a lively experiment from time to time. Yeah. You you can be read in just about every publication and heard <laughs> on just about every audio they outlet. Find, they do <laughs> you know? find, they find me. Yeah, they, they do. They find you, all right. <laughs> thanks <laughs> a lot. Bill. And you can find me back here with you on Friday with a brand new episode. Until then, I'm Bill Bartholomew. We'll talk soon. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com employers.